Okay, so I think we can uh, move on. And the next speaker is uh, Ignacia uh, Cancino-Aguirre, talking about uh, uh, metabolic variability in mycobacteria. Hello? Yeah? Yes. Okay. Um, so, good morning, everybody. I'm Ignacia Cancino, and I'm a PhD student at INRIA Grenoble in France, um, under the supervision of Gide de Jong and Delphine Robert. Um, and I will talk to you about uh, this new project that we started, um, that it's uh, about the analysis of microbacterial metabolism using genome scale metabolic models. Um, so just out of like motivation or context, um, Mycobacterium tuberculosis is a bacteria that causes tuberculosis. It's a disease that um, kills more than 1.6 million people every year. Um, and as you can see, it's present in almost every country. And despite all the efforts to eradicate it with vaccines and antibiotics, it's still uh, present. And um, also, it's become more and more resistant to antibiotics, so it's like a big problem. Um, but MTB, or Mycobacterium tuberculosis, is um, part of this genus, the Mycobacterium genus, which comprises around 200 uh, mycobacteria. Um, and yeah, uh, so it's part of this genus. Um, uh, along with other uh, pathogens like uh, Mycobacterium lepra um, and um, Mycobacterium ulcerans, etc. Um, so we it, we were very interested in looking at at the genus level of Mycobacteria because uh, they're very interesting. <laughs> they even if they're genetically kind of similar compared to other bacteria, um, they show uh, different phenotypes. So. Um, half of the genus divides in um, slow growers and like the other half in fast growers. And there's, that, there's like one clade that is kind of inter intermediate growth, but um, that it's like weirdly defined. Um, so th this is very interesting and there's been attempts to understand a bit why, but not that many. Um, <laughs> Um, it is interesting because a lot of the uh, slow growers are also pathogenic bacteria, and, um, but not all. <laughs> um, so just uh, as an example, um, yeah, some of the slow growers, there's MTB, there's ulcerans, uh, Mycobacterium marinum, um, that is pathogenic usually to fish, but like there's been clinical cases of infecting kids. Um, and there's also other the fast growers are Mycobacterium sphygmatis, um, for example, that is non-pathogenic and it's found in the environment. Um, but there's, it, it's not clear this uh, pathogenicity to growth rate um, um, relationship uh, because there's other bacteria like um, Mycobacterium abscessus, which is also pathogenic, but it's a fast grower. Um, and, but how do they, they define uh, what is a fast grower and what is a slow grower? So uh, usually, and this has been done for like 100 years, they, whenever they, they find a new, uh, let's say, mycobacteria, um, they, they plate it in this LJ um, complex media, rich media, um, and then they let it grow, and then they see uh, how long they, they take to form colonies. And if they take longer than seven days to form colonies, then they will consider them as slow growers. And if it's less than that, it would be a fast um, grower. Um, and this uh, LJ media, um, I mean, it's, it's very like complex. It has like egg and like potato starch and things. And, and it, it was developed like in the 1800s almost. <laughs> um, but it's still being used for clinical diagnosis uh, and isolation of mycobacteria. Um, but it's, it's very interesting that even that, that growing in this media, you could see also the relationship in the, in the phylogenetic tree. Um, yeah, so there's been, of course, some attempts to understand um, this difference in growth rates. Um, but it's really not that well studied as one would think of.
versus difference in lag? Um, ah, mm, well, they've always mentioned growth rate, and they haven't really mentioned lag time. So I'm not that uh, sure. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I mean, it could be lag, but then sometimes, I mean, when you uh, grow it in liquid media, um, sometimes they, they, and you measure absorbance, then there's no lag, it's just like very, very slow growing. Yeah. But, but yeah, it could be also the lag time, I guess. Um, yeah, so some of the issues to understand these, these difference. One is like um, very costly experimentally, and not just money, but also uh, time-wise, because they grow very slow. Um, I mean, yeah, they can take like, uh, I don't know, two to three weeks to do one growth curve. Um, some of them don't even grow in liquid media. Um, and you need, because they're pathogens, you need these biosafety level three labs or biosafety level two labs. Um, so yeah, but there's not that many studies and a lot of studies focus more on MTB infection in, in host cells. Um, then also pathogenicity is kind of a weird uh, <laughs> defined concept because um, there's no clear definition, at least in this area about it. Like some people say, okay, if it infects somebody, then it's pathogenic. Some people say, oh, but if it infects, um, let's say many people with like healthy immune system, then it's pathogenic. If not, it's just opportunistic. Um, um, some of them infect other mammals. Um, also, they don't necessarily optimize uh, their, their proteome allocation. So if you want to see it that way, we saw in, the, uh, in a Terry's talk last week, he studied uh, Smegmatis, which is like the fast grower for us, but for E. coli, it's like a very slow grower. Um, and they weren't optimizing um, uh, their proteome allocation to grow more. Um, they would invest in other uh, functions of the cell. Um, and also about this, uh, if you would explain it by the number of uh, rRNA operon copy numbers, uh, they have very low uh, copy numbers. So most of them have like one or two um, and still not clear uh, because some like fast growers, m most of fast growers have two copies and most of slow growers have one, but a few of the fast growers have one, um, yeah, have one and then, yeah. So it's, it's not like a clear uh, relation. And also these studies have been done by like very few bacteria. So I guess you could maybe look more into that if you want, because they're usually done in maybe like four or five of these bacteria. But anyways, this is, yeah, not, um, enough for us, I guess, to, to really understand why they're growing um, differently. So we were thinking that uh, one way of studying this growth rate variability is by studying their metabolism, uh, right? Because, I mean, you can study all the reactions that are happening that account for biomass production, um, and then you can relate it to their growth rate. Um, so the approach of this project is uh, using genome scale metabolic models, as we have heard these past few weeks. Um, they model um, the metabolite dynamics uh, in the cells, right? Um, and then they relate the uh, stereometric matrix um, of the, that has stereometric coefficients for all of the metabolites um, in reactions. Um, and then you multiply it by a vector of the reaction rate. And then if we assume that they're in a stationary state, then we can equal that to zero for the internal um, metabolite. Um, and then we can also constrain uh, this uh, fluxes uh, with uh, either experimental information or thermodynamic um, information like directions, um, etc. And then we will have like a constrained space of solution for this uh, system of, of linear, um, this linear system. 
and then we can analyze it in different ways as we saw. Um, so we thought that this method could be useful for us to understand um, why they're varying in, in growth rates. Uh, but like, of course, there are some issues and um, some issues with this approach is that uh, there's only, I mean, there's only like two genome scale models for mycobacteria, so mostly for MTB. And then there's some like strains of TB that have been done. Um, and then mycobacterium bovis BCG, which is actually the one that they use for vaccines. Um, but they're very, very similar as well. And actually they kind of merged these models at one point and used that one to, uh, to analyze both of them. Uh, like recently they have, of course, differentiated them a bit more. Um, so yeah, that's the only mycobacteria that has a model. So <laughs> uh, we would have to uh, reconstruct more. And then of course there's the experimental limitations as I mentioned before, you need a BS uh, biosafety level three and biosafety level two labs. Um, some of them don't grow on liquid media. Um, like uh, Mycobacterium ulcerans doesn't grow on liquid media. Um, and some of them, I mean, and, and a lot of them take a lot of time to grow and also to go from um, like solid plate to the, the liquid flask. It would take like a month or something to to adapt to those conditions. And they also tend to clump a lot. So it's, it's a bit, yeah, annoying to, to do these uh, growth curves on, on liquid media. But luckily there's the reference genomes available on NCBI. And um, um, there's also experimental information on like, uh, you know, single, single bacteria or single species and there could be some some information in general about the phenotypes uh, and maybe some pathways. Uh, and we also have this, um, that I forgot to say it, a, lab, uh, a collaboration with uh, the Francis Crick Institute in London, um, where they focus a lot on mycobacterial metabolism and antibiotic resistance, and they have these biosafety level three labs, and uh, they do very nice stuff as well. Um, so the idea of the project is to develop uh, genome scale metabolic models for um, um, the different mycobacterial species um, and so validate those, then at the same time obtain um, uh, exchange rates and growth rates for these different bacteria grown on the same conditions. Um, and then after we have these two components, the idea is to analyze them. And because I said that mycobacteria don't really optimize uh, things, <laughs> strategies, uh, um, we would do the analysis by uniform sampling because we don't want to assume uh, optimality. Uh, and then the idea is to compare how the fluxes behave in the network between the different uh, types of mycobacteria. So first of all, we, we started by asking ourselves, okay, but can we actually infer um, the intracellular fluxes uh, with the already published model of uh, TB? Because if not, then th this approach wouldn't really hold. Um, and so we found uh, one data set of carbon-13 measurements uh, of the intracellular fluxes. Um, and so we constrain our models with the exchange rates that they measured and um, a few thermodynamical um, information like uh, reaction direction and, um, and the growth rate. And then we use uniform sampling. Um, and then we also remove some of these uh, invisible loops with the uh, cycle to flux. You, maybe some of you may know it. But um, so we found that, uh, so, this is only like four um, of the reactions, but I mean, we have the results for all of them in the network. There's like 1,300 reactions. Um, and we found that um, for most of them, the, the, our simulations were at least in the range of the experimental value. So we have the, the, the blue curve, which is our simulation from the sampling, and then the red uh, dashed lines are the experimental values. So 
uh, we thought, okay, I mean, even if the mode is not necessarily the, the exact value, um, they're still in the, in the range, and then we can infer fluxes at least uh, uh, with this model. So then we continued, <laughs> and then we, we started the part of reconstructing genome scale metabolic models, which is like a actually long and tedious process. <laughs> Um, so we tried to use automatic uh, tools um, because uh, in the beginning we wanted to do it uh, for the 200 species um, and so there was like no way that I, a PhD student, like learning about this <laughs> would do it in um, three years. Um, so we, we looked at some automatic tools that are, are, are already, um, I would say, widely used. I mean, they're from 2018, CARFME, maybe some of you have heard it. Um, and they create already like a connected network. So they do align the genome to a database, but then they also make sure that they, they are connected. Um, and the, but the issue with this is that sometimes it tends to add more reactions that there actually are. Um, so you still do need like a, a step of manual refinement, refinement or maybe some gap filling. I mean, it's not too automatic. Um, and we also, because we saw this in the beginning and we were not satisfied with uh, the model it was creating, uh, we also implemented some other filters uh, for CARVME. So um, yeah, some uh, like playing with the alignment parameters. Um, and we also updated the database they had with this new MTB model that we thought it would be useful. Um, so then we tested, so we tried this pipeline with uh, tuberculosis because there's already a, a curated model for that. Um, and then we tested it with this um, growth metrics. So. Um, they indexed in the lab, they, they grow um, TB in single carbon or single nitrogen sources, and then they, they say if, if they see some growth, they, it doesn't matter the rate, but just if they see some growth, they would uh, classify it as one, and if not, zero. Um, and so we did the same uh, with our model, doing FBA, and just, I mean, we didn't care about the, the value of the rate of the growth rate, but just if it was higher than zero. Um, and so we actually, in our model, uh, it got very similar predictions to uh, the reference uh, model that is already published, which is nice because it was mostly done automatically. <laughs> and um, it's, it's a slightly better than, than the reference, but not too much, it's actually very similar. Um, except that it has more reactions, so it has 1,700 reactions and uh, 1,200 metabolites. Um, so this was nice. Um, but then we're in the part of uh, the work in progress, <laughs> which is applying this pipeline to uh, other species. So in the beginning, we thought of doing it for the 200 species, but then because it still needs some manual refinement, uh, we thought of um, for the 200 species, just doing um, functional genome analysis, so to see which uh, genes that uh, codify for enzymes that have reactions associated to them, uh, which ones are present in the slow growers and in the fast growers, um, so not really quantitative. Um, but then uh, we would take from those species 18 that we're actually growing in the lab and that we are producing this uh, growth metric, so uh, does it grow in single carbon sources or not? Um, because those we can actually validate them with some data. Um, so then we would do the, the models of those, uh, validate them with this uh, phenotype data set. And then from those, <laughs> um, because doing the growth curves take a very long time, we thought of starting with at least five species that uh, have this difference in growth rates and actually do the growth rate of those and measure, uh, sorry, the growth curves of those and measure growth rate and metabolite exchanges. So that would be like, uh, that would be five species. Um, and, and yeah, and that would also be more carefully curated. 
Um, so then this is experimental part, um, which uh, I'm helping out, but not uh, I'm not the, the only one doing it. Um, we have a researcher in, in the creek that's actually continuing the experiments, but we kind of uh, discussed it together, and I did a few of these curves. Um, so we chose to do the, the growth curves of five species. So from those, uh, we chose um, three fast growers and two slow growers. And um, for the fast growers, there's one that's pathogenic and the others are not. Um, and then for the slow growers, they're both pathogenic. Um, and then we de decided to grow it in a defined media because the LJ media that is actually used to to classify them as fast and slow. It's a complex media and uh, there's many stuff and it's very variable so we cannot really rely on it to, to have these uh, quantitative um, rates. Um, and so we used uh, 789 media which is like a very gold standard media for mycobacteria and it kind of, it's not the same composition but it does, um, resemble the phenotypes seen with the LJ media. Um, and then we would use the optimal temperature of those. And yeah, about temperature, there's two of these that grow at 30 degrees and others at 37. So we would use the optimal temperatures of those. Um, yeah. And then it would be aerobic growth, so shaking uh, the flask. And uh, we thought about, okay, which media should we test? And then um, we decided to do it on the 7H9 uh, that has uh, glycerol, glutamate, and glucose as carbon sources. Uh, and then we also thought, okay, maybe we could also see how they behave or how they change their growth rates if you just grow it on single carbon source media. So we chose glutamate and glucose. We tried also with glycerol, but they tend to clump a lot, a few of them. So then OD measurements are not really reliable, uh, even if you're using detergent. And then the idea is to yeah, measure growth and also uh, measure metabolite uptake um, for those over time. So um, all in all, um, the project is to study microbacterial metabolism, um, to hopefully explain better why they have this uh, growth rate variability. Um, the approach that we're using is this constraint-based modeling um, and implementing experimental data. Um, we're in the process of reconstructing the models for, for the other mycobacterial species and testing those. Um, at the same time, obtaining the experimental information. And um, so whatever, what, what is left to do, which I think it's the most like nice part of the project, is actually comparing the, the flux spaces between the different uh, species and see if we could find, hopefully, <laughs> um, some clues of why um, they are acting different with respect to growth rates or maybe why some pathways are more active, let's say in some group than others. Um, so just to finish, um, I want to thank uh, my lab, um, my supervisors, Elfine and Hide, and um, we have a new postdoc now that's also helping a lot with the bioinformatics. Um, and our collaborators at the Creek. So the principal investigator is Luis Pedro Carvalho and uh, Aceli, she's helping me with experiments there. Uh, so yeah, thanks then. Yeah. Questions? Thanks a lot, do we have time for a few questions? Hi, thanks. So, um, I mean, I know you're not on the experimental side, but can you elaborate a bit more on why you chose to take glucose, glutamate, and glycerol? So what was kind of the rationale behind selecting those carbon sources? Yeah, so, I mean, they were based on the gold standard media for TB um, or for mycobacterial identification, which is... Uh, 
uh, apart from the LJ that's complex, uh, the 7H9 uh, middle group media. So that media has these three carbon sources. And then already, because there's been most of studies, they do it on this media. We have more experimental information to kind of validate our models, for example, um, and also to, to compare and, and yeah. So we didn't want to create a new media from scratch. Um, so that's why we chose those three carbon sources. Other questions? Yeah, this is a curiosity. So I, it's the first time that I think about this this mycobacterium, but it seems almost like there, um, there's this established pattern of the slow growers being more virulent or being mm -hmm. more pathogenic. From the physiology, is there any? What's like the typical explanation that people give? Are they? So I've. I've there's not like a clear answer, uh, also because there's a lot of uh, the fast growers that are becoming more pathogenic. Apparently, they they they've seen that they have the the pathogenic one. They have lost some genes, so they can only grow intracellularly. Um, yeah, they have some proteins. I think that they say that related to virulence, but they're not, but like the fast growers also have them, but just like a difference in those proteins. So yeah, it's not actually that clear, um, the, the physiology of them. Actually, I want to follow up on this question. Um, can you maybe, I don't know, uh, say where the fast-growing or non-pathogenic bacteria found in which kind of environments? Because yes, I imagine, so for example, for E. coli, we see that UPEC has way lower growth rates than our lab strains. Of course, they've also been evolved. So maybe there's also something going on with they actually benefit for um, changing colonization habitats um, mm -hmm. when they grow slower. I don't know. Yeah, so most of the fast grower, they have been found in soil and water bodies. Um, there's no specific trend, but just more like environments, I would say. While the pathogenic are usually found intracellularly, I guess because they already infect. And I, um, yeah, I, I think it has to do also, there were some studies looking at uh, that the fast growers can use more diversity of resources, while the pathogenic ones, they can take only a few of those. So I think it does uh, affect uh, that. Yeah. So, um, you know, for MTB, let's say, um, the kind of environment that it grows in when it is a pathogen, um, is that known? What is that, uh, mm -hmm. what is that environment? And can that be um, sort of uh, uh, simulated in these uh, flux balance uh, yeah. um, uh, sort of yeah. theoretical uh, uh, studies? Yeah, so um, MTB grows on macrophages, in the phagosome of macrophages in the body, and um, there is, there has been actually very interesting studies with these published uh, GM scale model of TB um, on the host, so macrophage model and the TB model and how they interact. Um, so yes, it can be modeled. Um, also, you could also do it in the lab. So what they do in the, in the Louise lab, they take macrophages uh, from blood of uh, donors um, and then they infect with TB and then they study different things like, I don't know, how pH changes, for example, and things like this. But there, ha I actually wanted to, to, in the beginning, I mean, I thought of like, oh, what if we can do growth curves in this macrophage-like media? But there's actually no macrophage-like media at the moment. They really just take the macrophages. Uh, but that takes forever. I mean, like, it takes even longer. And the thing, not just the time, but also uh, it changes from patient to patient. Uh, so if you have like fresh blood, I don't know, with like better macrophages, then it's not a nice experiment. But then 
um, next week you get new blood and then it's like not that great, I don't know, and they don't really have information of the patient because it's confidential. So um, yeah, I think it would be very, we talked about this in the lab and it was like, oh, it, was, it would be very nice to have a synthetic media that, re that resembles the macrophages, but then I think that's like another work. And so everybody has been pushing it kind of. <laughs> But I think it, 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 it would be very nice to, to do that. Yeah. Any other question? Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Okay, so.